Hey, welcome back. Today the topic is a shootout between um, an original copy, original mono, of Roy Brooks's Beat and the latest stereo reissue, uh, which was put out by Verve by Request. Um, so about a week ago, I covered another uh, title that was in the Verve by Request um, sort of catalog. Um, I'll put, I'll say catalog loosely because these are the first two that have been uh, that have been released. So uh, the first one was Alice Coltrane's uh, Ta the El Dowd, um, and the second one is uh, is Roy Brooks's Beats. But there's a whole calendar of these uh, Verve by request uh, reissues that have um, already been scheduled from now into June of uh, of next year. So a ton of great stuff. Uh, really, like all of these albums are great. They're all great choices. I think the uh, the key question that we're trying to um, that we're still trying to work through is whether they're um, sort of worthwhile treatments um, in terms of uh, in terms of reissues. So my comments around uh, Ta the El Dowd is that uh, the reissue was not as strong as uh, as the original, um, and you know there were certainly elements or, or areas, certain tracks where the reissue uh, uh, was better, and, and and I you know made some comments about um, even sort of nuances in terms of the uh, the sonics um, where the reissue was a little bit better. But overall, my assessment was the original um, was the better reissue. And, um, and that's fine. I mean, th here's the thing is that um, generally speaking, and I would say over the last like 10 or 20 years, I think most people have just assumed that the original is better. And, and probably in many cases it was because the reissues that were coming out before vinyl kind of had this resurgence, they weren't sourced from the original tapes um, and they just weren't the best quality uh, all around. I mean, the packaging wasn't as good, the vinyl material wasn't as good, and they weren't uh, using the, uh, the the right source material um, with obviously plenty of exceptions, right? Um, but lately the expectation has been, I think, that these, uh, that these uh, reissues are going to um, beat the, no pun intended, beat the, uh, the original. Um, and I think that there are examples of that, right? So Tone Poet is doing just a phenomenal job with their reissues. Um, Analog Productions Acoustic Sounds is doing a great job. Um, so there's there's re, there's labels that are um, you know really doing the the source material justice, I think, with the reissues. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that every uh, new reissue label um, or series is going to do the very same thing. Not everything can be an audio file release. Um, or, or just simply, it, it, you know, they can't always beat out, uh, beat out the originals. And I, it sounds like some of the reason for that is, uh, is when the master tapes are gone. And that was the case in Ta the El Dowd. Uh, I believe those tapes were uh, burned in the um, sort of infamous universal fire that everyone blames for everything anytime master tapes are missing. Um, and, uh, and, and so they, I don't know exactly how they sourced it, um, and, and I just don't have that kind of detail. I actually don't have the detail behind this either, uh, behind uh, Roy Brooks's beat. Um, but this is an interesting one um, for this for this reason. The original doesn't sound good. It's never sounded good. Um, anybody who's had the original would never say that it sounds that it's, that it's a great sounding recording. So it's very interesting then when uh, a label comes in and decides to to reissue it because if it didn't sound great before, like you know, you, it, the sense is you can only get better, right? Maybe. Um, and, and so uh, that was the primary reason why I wanted to pick up this reissue because I knew that the original doesn't sound good. Um, so that is what uh, that is what we're going to uh, sort of talk through in today's video. All right. So firstly, um, Roy Brooks's beat was put out on a label called called uh, Workshop Jazz. Workshop Jazz was the um, sort of subsidiary of Motown, and it was supposed to be focused on their jazz releases. Um, they typically seem to populate these uh, these releases with sort of session musicians that were they were already using for other um, Motown albums, more in their sort of primary um, primary sort of space, um, but not exclusively. Um, it also didn't last very long. So uh, the first Workshop Jazz title was released in 1962, and the last one, I believe, was uh, released in 1964. Um, many of these titles weren't uh, reissued frequently, I would say. Um, Beat is an example of a record that um, had a few variations uh, in 1964 in terms of mono and stereo. Um, there was some sort of 60s Japanese uh, reissue of this title that borderline doesn't exist. Um, I want to say it was put out in South Africa, but it probably wasn't a legit release. 
Um, and then it hasn't been on vinyl otherwise, except for a release from Spain about two years ago. Can't speak for that one, don't know anything about it, but um, there certainly hasn't been a US reissue of this title ever. And so um, what's resulted is that uh, simply this is a difficult album to get uh, in its original form. Um, as of the recording of this video, I saw that there's one copy listed on, um, on Discogs uh, for $450. And that's it. And, and routinely, I would say, whether it's mono or stereo, um, it's it's certainly a sort of over one hundred dollar item um, if you're if you're looking for an original pressing. So um, anyway, uh, Workshop Jazz had some other stuff. Uh, there was one by Pepper Adams that's pretty worthwhile. I'm trying to think some of the other. Um, they had like Earl Washington recorded a few. Um, but generally speaking, it was kind of like oddball releases. There wasn't a lot of consistency across them in terms of style, in terms of the musicians featured. Um, and I would say, I'm, I'll just say that it, it felt like there was sort of lack of direction um, with this very limited um, sort of series. So, uh, is it, I mean, it's a fun one to collect, I suppose, but uh, I've, I've owned most of those titles over the years and, and I don't own many uh, anymore um, because they just didn't get that much play. Um, but anyway, Roy Brooks's beat is one of those that you can tell the caliber of the music is quite high, and yet the execution of it was quite poor. Um, and so what I want to do in this video is talk a little bit about the album, the original pressing. Actually only going to talk about, I think, two tracks uh, from each, and then I'm going to continue talking about the remaining uh, tracks from this, uh, from this reissue, just to kind of focus us a little bit more on, um, on, on what's new. So firstly, uh, with this album, uh, Roy Brooks is at the helm. There's not a lot of albums with Roy Brooks as a leader, but the ones that are out there are worthwhile. Um, we also have Blue Mitchell on, uh, on trumpet. We have Hugh Lawson on piano. Um, Junior Cook is on sax. George Bohannon is on trombone. And who did I miss? Uh, Gene Taylor on bass. So... Um, so that is the uh, that is the lineup. I suppose that means it's a sextet, and um, yeah. So so I guess a couple of other things in terms of the, the content here. Um, there are two tunes by Joe Henderson, who's obviously not in the lineup, but there's uh, two uh, provided by Joe Henderson. There's one by Alice Coltrane, uh, credited as Alice McLeod because she hadn't uh, married John Coltrane yet. Um, and then there is one by Duke Pearson. There's one by Roy Brooks, so one sort of original. Uh, and then there's a Tad Dameron tune. So I would say most of the content is um, sort of modern content, at least uh, as of the, uh, the uh, dates of this, uh, of this recording. And that's, um, and that's encouraging, I think. Um, um, in addition, I would say that the, the tone of this is a, is a little bit less sort of soul jazz, which is kind of becoming a thing, and maybe you'd expect it to be that because of Motown. Um, there is a track that, that has a little bit of that, but I'd say the rest of it is, um, is, is more in the bop space, some a little bit in the modal space, but we're not really there yet, right? This is like 1963 when it was uh, when it was being recorded, and so they hadn't made that sort of transition from um, the modal stuff that Miles Davis was doing to what modal jazz sort of led into in terms of like spiritual jazz and sort of post bop and that type of thing. That that didn't hadn't really happened yet. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of the lay of the land on uh, on this album, um, and let's talk about uh, a couple of those tracks. All right, so um, this is the original that we're talking about. It is a mono edition. Um, so the reissue is stereo, so there's a little bit of an unfair comparison, but hey, what are you going to do? Um, the opening track is called Home Stretch, and it is by Joe Henderson. Um, what's, what's most prominent about this opening track, which, by the way, is the worst track on this album, um, not in terms of the musicianship, um, the music that they're playing, but again, in terms of how it was recorded. The um, piano and bass are just very, very soft um, on this opener. And um, Junior Cook offers a solo and he sounds great. Generally speaking, the horns sound great on this, uh, on this album. Not necessarily when they're doing unison melodies, but when, they're, when they have um, solo improvisation, they do sound good. Um, I would say that when George Bohannon's solo uh, comes about, it sounds a little sloppy. Um, and muddy, I would say, with some of the uh, other horn accents playing behind it. 
Um, it just doesn't sound uh, it doesn't sound that great. Um, Blue Mitchell also takes a solo. I mean, you know, let's be real. A lot of this stuff is like blowing sessions. There's lots and lots of solos on this uh, on this album, which which is great because it features the musicians and 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 that. But um, the trumpet sounds good. Generally speaking, I think uh, trumpet in mono sounds pretty good just because of its brightness. Um, but the the main problem here. Um, after all, you know, I said it was like the worst on the track, and then I talk about how, how good everything is. Um, the uh, well, I mentioned piano and bass are soft, way too soft. The drums are just ever present throughout this entire track. The cymbals just shimmer over everything in a really kind of like tinny, like tin, you know, tinny, um, distracting way. Um, when Hugh Lawson solos on this uh, track, it's in the front, so they do bring forward his solo um, when he when he when he has it, and it does sound good. Um, and, and it's like, and he's just fantastic. It's like a really frenetic uh, solo. It's super fast paced song. But uh, the the problem here is that the cymbals are just washing over everything and kind of like mute any possibility of there being nuance or dynamics or detail in any of the other instruments except when um, you have some of these horn solos and so um, how that wh what the result is here on this um, on this first track I don't know I'm still holding this um, is that um, is is what it, the recording feels cold um, like like it lacks any kind of warmth or like roundness to it at all. Um, it feels like the dynamics of the studio are causing a real problem for almost everybody who plays. Um, it's interesting because the drums, you can hear the sound of the studio kind of re reflecting some of the noise, but you can in the piano as well. Um, and it, it just feels like there's, there's way too much going on. And, and I don't know why, I don't, you know, who knows what the situation was with the miking um, and, and what studio they were in, I'm not even sure. But whatever it was, the it just wasn't set up right uh, to record this particular track. All right, so that opening track on this um, reissue, and first of all, this is what the reissue looks like. Again, this is a stereo edition. There's no gatefold here; uh, doesn't need to be. Um, and you know, this is the same kind of uh, cover quality, I suppose, as the uh, Taw the L Dowd, and I'm sure all of them are going to be. I did not get the yellow edition because I'm not going to get the yellow editions of these records. Um, I'm going to, you know, draw the line in the sand on that one. Um, but uh, you know, it's fine. This isn't this isn't one of those tip-on jackets. That's you know, it's it's not even particularly thick, but it is what it is. These aren't as expensive as the uh, analog production stuff, nor the Tone Poets. So um, anyway, um, so this track. Uh, let me first say again, because it's stereo. So the horns are in the left channel, um, but there's a ton of bleed into the right. <laughs> um, the piano seems to be in the center, the bass is in the right, and the drums are sort of left center, but also with a lot of bleed. So if you combine all that together, the only thing that feels like it's really in the right is the bass. Um, and everything else is you know, either in the center or to the left, and there's and there seems to be this kind of bleed across. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of that piano, so I mentioned that the piano wasn't as prominent as I would have liked in this uh, in this opening track. Uh, the piano is still in the background. Um, it feels a little bit better balanced though with the drums and the bass, um, and you and that sort of manifests itself, especially on uh, Junior Cook's solo, which um, which sounds better here. Um, let's see, Bohannon's horn, because um, he takes, uh, I think, the second solo, uh, much warmer in feel, um, in, 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 in it, and it sounds, it just sounds better. It's not as like um, sort of abrasive and again, kind of cold. I hope that makes sense, like when I say cold and warm. Um, the trumpet here, I would say, sounds softer and it's not as abrasive when playing the accents behind uh, Bohannon's solo. So that was one of my complaints in the uh, in the original, and it does um, it does sound better. Um, problem is, as as was my problem on the first track, uh, or sorry, on the original, the cymbals um, shimmer over over everything. Um, so it's still a problem with how it was recorded that they weren't able to correct, um, at least fully, because this track does sound better um, on the uh, reissue than it does on the original. Um, what else did I say? I talked about Blue Mitchell's solo and he generally sounds good. His solo just sounds better here. Um, it sounds warmer than on the previous one, which was still a little too, maybe too abrasive, too sort of cold. Um, but, um, 
Yeah, so it's, it's just kind of weird, right? Because I have all these problems about this, uh, about the original version. They do address some of them, but not all of them, at least to, to what I would expect this to sound like. Bottom line, um, this, this first track sounds more like a live recording than it does a studio one. And that's not good because this was recorded in a studio. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit too loose. There's too much room noise. It doesn't feel like it was mic'd right. And, um, and yeah, it's just kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of a problem. <laughs> Um, with the first track, but um, things do change uh, with with the uh, with the later tracks. Okay, um, so track two, and we'll, let's uh, let's jump back to that original. Um, the track name is "If You Could See Me Now." This is the Tad Dameron uh, offering on this uh, on this album, so it's an older tune. Um, so on this one, the brushwork is like awful. Like, it's just, it's so abrasive. It's so, like, loud. And it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound, um, it doesn't sound balanced. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's sort of across the entire uh, thing. It's like, it's like somebody dialed up the volume on just Brooks's brushes. And it, and it drowns out some of the rest of, uh, of the music. Um, Junior Cook is a highlight here. Um, he has a uh, sax solo that is quite nice. Uh, the other horns don't, I think they provide like a unison melody or kind of some accents and stuff. They don't solo here. So it's, it's much more of a Junior Cook feature and fortunately he sounds great. Um, Hugh Lawson's piano is more forward in the mix uh, than it was on track one. And um, I would say, I, I suppose that this sounds better without the addition of the trumpet and the trombone, but the balance is just off. Those brushes sound very unnatural. Um, and, and again, this was not, um, th this is another track that, that just sounds like the fault in it was not the musicians, but that it wasn't recorded well. All right, so um, so let's talk about this uh, reissue. Um, uh, overall, this is what I would say. If Ryan Smith and Sterling Sound and, and the folks behind um, behind the reissue couldn't uh, couldn't save uh, the first track despite their best efforts, they do a really good job saving track two. Um, so um, let's let's see. Um, so we're talking the stereo edition now. Uh, Junior Cook is in the center. Uh, the drums still kind of feel like left center. The piano seems left center, and again the bass is on the right. Um, so it's kind of a weird separation or or maybe lack thereof separation. But um, the biggest change here is that drums are much, 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 much better balanced, um, especially with the brushes. It's not nearly as tinny. This track is way more enjoyable, may, way more what you would expect a um, expect the music to sound like. Um, I would still say that it's not like this isn't like a you know a ton of detail in um, in individual musicians. Um, and again, the stereo separation is a little nebulous. But um, but they did they just did a, a much better job um, with this uh, with this particular track. Um, so that actually is is um, that sort of sets the tone for the rest of this album um, because I honestly continue to have issues with the original in terms of how it sounds. Not as much as on that first track and second track on the original, but. Um, what I just said in terms of um, in terms of them kind of fixing some of the problems with track two, uh, they do that and then some uh, for the uh, for the rest of the album on the on the reissue. All right, so let's go through that. Um, track three is passing the buck. Um, this is the uh, the offering by uh, Roy Brooks. Um, so let's see. Here, the bass is more prominent. The drums are um, are more in the left. I think with the piano. Um, but but in, independent, I guess, of the stereo uh, separation, this this is really where um, the album or the, sort of the sound seems to gel. And I think that this is the best track on the entire album. Um, Bohannon has a really nice sort of nuanced solo that I think captures his tone very well. It's very warm, and it's like there's there is more detail to it. Junior Cook sounds really great. Um, here, there is more of a sense, I would say, of the studio sound. Um, than the, that the first tracks didn't have. So I kind of mentioned that the first two tracks, or at least the first one, and eh, probably the second one too, had a little bit of like a live music kind of feel. Not here. This sounds this sounds much more like a, a kind of like like a better 
uh, layout in a studio. Um, and again, best best sounding track on the album. Um, track four is um, is is let's see, what is it called? It's called it's another Joe Henderson tune. I know that it opens uh, it opens uh, side uh, two. It's called Solon Solon um, S O U L I uh, L I N. And um, again, very balanced. Like they they cleaned up their act um, completely from uh, from the first uh, from those first two tracks. Um, Blue Mitchell has a really nice solo here um, with Hugh Lawson's uh, piano comping in the background, and and that kind of interaction just sounds uh, sounds fantastic. Um, much better than uh, than on the original. Um, the, the problems with the original do kind of like slightly go away. It really was a problem with those first two tracks, but it's such a shame because that's what opens the album. Like, what you know, how would you get motivated to pull out this album and play it when the first two tracks just don't sound good? So I, I'm really happy that um, even though even though there was like a kind of a marginal improvement on the track on track one, they really killed it with track two, especially track three. Track four sounds great, like I just said on Solon. All right, track five is called Soul Sphere, and that is by Alice McLeod or, uh, or Alice Coltrane. Um, so this one, I would say, you know what I'm wondering is, is if, this, uh, if this track was actually recorded around the time of the first two, because it doesn't quite sound as good as track three and four. It sounds a little bit more like a problem with them, um, with the balance and sort of lack of stereo separation and kind of the bleed. Um, cymbals do seem a little tinny here, um, but, but at the same time, it, it sounds better than the original. Um, that's that's for sure. Like it, it sounds it sounds significantly better. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to you know wh what are you supposed to do if the source material is kind of lacking? But this is still such a worthwhile album. I mean, again, Roy Brooks just didn't do that much, and so as a leader, and so when he is at the helm, you just want to hear it. Um, and and, and uh, I'll, I'll say this, that Roy Brooks was like a triple disc on uh, Record Store Day. Uh, was it a Record Store Day release like a few years ago? Or was it a regular release in any event? I think it was Record Store Day. That one had some problems too with the uh, with, with the mic setup. And, and there were elements of it that, that just didn't sound as great, but then there were, some of the content sounded really good. So it's, it's almost like you just kind of have to deal with some of these issues on some of these great recordings um, just in order to be able to hear it. And, um, and again, at least with this uh, Verve by Request, uh, reissue, they resolved many of the problems. Um, if not, if if not, like they, they didn't resolve all of them. They resolved many of them, and in every situation, um, it is better than the uh, than the original. Um, so that final track I will mention. Um, it's called "My Secret Passion," and it is by Duke Pearson. I would say that this is the most squarely blues track. And so, if you're more of a fan of kind of the soul blues or like blue note hard bop thing that incorporated a lot of those elements, um, then you're probably going to like this one quite a bit. And obviously, Duke Pearson provided so much, um, so many compositions for for Blue Note, and was their A and R man for for so long. So his foot, his fingerprint was like all over that label, especially in the '60s. And um, you do get uh, a little bit of that kind of sound here on this uh, on this last track. Um, and it's a really welcome addition to the album. It probably has the most catchy melody and probably is the most sort of melodic or like lyrical sounding um, track on the entire album. Um, I still think that Pass in the Buck um, track three is, um, keep having to, uh, to verify, um, yeah, Pass in the Buck tra uh, is track three, is, uh, is the best one on, uh, on the album. And so if you want to preview anything, I don't know, maybe preview that one, um, check it out because it's, uh, because it's great. Um, but but yeah, so that that's it. I mean, there's there's six tracks on this thing. Um, I didn't want to keep going back and forth between them because because it was just too clear to me that the Verve by Request um, reissue uh, is uh, is is the better one. And so here again, you know, you we sort of encounter the situation where there's the uh, there's the original that goes for a lot of money. Um, and I suppose people are going to still seek that that out. But anybody who hasn't gotten a copy yet um, and wants to hear this uh, hear, hear this album here we go um, this this verve by request series seems to um, you know it seems to be a, a great option so I guess in conclusion um, I mean the original of Ta the El Dowd one here the reissue wins um, so the jury is out I guess on what is to come with verve by request and all of the titles they plan to cover um, and so I guess I guess I'm gonna have to uh, continue to pick up uh, strategically a few of these, right? I'm not I'm not gonna buy all of them, but um, you know the Ahmad Jamal one I'll probably end up getting because I think my original is like VG or maybe even lesser condition. Um, so so we'll see. 
and I'll, I'll try to continue to cover maybe those, um, you know, sort of the highlights in the series as they are uh, released over time. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in. Please hit subscribe. If you want to check out that Ta the El Dowd um, uh, discussion and shootout, it's a couple videos before this one. I'll drop a link in the uh, description of this as well. But um, anyway, thanks for tuning in.